What is up, fellow nerds, and welcome back to the Dapper Snapper Gaming Channel, and welcome back to How Do I Want to Do This? This is our series where we take a look at all playable options available to players in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, then we rank them on a scale of 1 to 10, and either build them or fix them depending on how they rank. Now today we finish up our talks on the Way of the Open Hand Monk. Of course, if you missed our ranking video, that'll be up in the i card above for you to check out right there, and that way you can figure out all of the ins and outs of this subclass before we jump into building one today. But assuming that you have already seen that, welcome to the build guide. And so I'm so glad that you are here. Make sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe if you haven't already. Most people who watch the channel are not actually subscribed, so please don't be one of those people. Help us to reach our goal of 5,000 by the end of this year. I think we can do it, but I need your help in order to do that. Of course, other great ways to support the channel are, of course, to share the video with your friends and click the bell so you're notified when new videos are uploaded. And finally, of course, joining the channel. For all of these build guides and my subclass fixes, I do post these formal guides for you to check out. And of course, those can be accessed by joining the channel at the lowest tier, actually. For only $2 a month, you can join the channel at the bronze tier and gain access to all of my build guides and subclass fixes. And so those are going up every week for you to keep and use and enjoy at your table, anything you want to do with those. And of course, above that, silver members, of course, get a special shout out. So here, of course, are our silver members. Thank you, of course, for joining the channel at silver or above. I really appreciate your support. You, of course, get the videos early at that point as well, one day early, and you, of course, get the shout outs here. And gold tier actually get priority picks on our variety builds. Last week, we did our variety build with the Infiltrator Armorer, which is up in the i card above right there. You all seem to really enjoy that. So if you want your build concept to make it to the top of that list and to really be seen, this is your chance, right? That gives you that opportunity. And of course, the gold tier will be expanding later on to get even more incentives there. So why not jump in early? With all that out of the way, let's actually jump into this build guide. So like I said back on Tuesday, the open hand monk is really, really fun and honestly is a 10 out of 10 after level 17. The problem with that is that we really aren't a 10 out of 10 up until that point. And so I wanted to think of a really fun way to build this. I'm not going to say this is necessarily the best way or the optimal way. That's not really what I'm about. I want to do a fun way of looking at these subclasses, right? And so today, that is what we have done. We have looked at a really fun way to do this. And then in the honorable mentions, a lot of times I'll give you the way if you wanted to really do this optimally, then that's kind of that section for you. So make sure to stick around for that section. The open hand monk is really how to be the most monk you can possibly be in its way of controlling key, in its way of healing. You've got a little bit of everything sprinkled into this kit. And so the open hand technique is just fantastic at level three. You've got kind of a dead spot in the middle, unfortunately, with six and 11, and then 17, it just blows it out of the water again. So for this, unfortunately, we are going to have to push off our uh, quivering palm a little bit, but we actually will make it to level 17 on this build for once in Monk. And so you will actually get to see it, but we're not gonna be taking as full advantage of it as with other builds. I will talk about a build in the honorable mentions again that takes full advantage of Quivering Palm, and uh, it's, it's actually really, really cool as well, but we'll get to that a little bit later. With all that out of the way, let's jump in. Starting off, as always, we have our race, and I have been talking about the possibility of taking this race for forever now. And I've been putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, taking custom lineage here, taking something else there. We're finally going to Tabaxi. Tabaxi is a really, really cool race, especially with its improvements in Monsters of the Multiverse. And it just provides us some really awesome options. Now, again, I'm gonna say, I do think that there is one other race choice, not counting custom lineage and all that, that is a little bit better than this, but I think Tabaxi offers us enough to where I'm still really happy with taking this race and I don't really have any regrets about it, but there are some other options out there. We'll talk about that later. But for this, the Tabaxi is a cat. So who doesn't wanna be a cat, right? There's a whole song about it and you get some really awesome stuff. You get a climb speed, which is very unique. 
you get an improvement to your unarmed strikes as of Monsters of the Multiverse. Used to, it was a D4, now it's a D6, so that's already gonna jump us forward in our progression for our unarmed strikes, so that's huge too. We get perception and stealth proficiency, which are huge, those are two of the best stats in the game. Feline agility, giving us that burst of speed. For all of those things, we're getting a lot out of this one racial kit, and so I really can't turn this down. It's just really strong. We also, of course, as with pretty much any of the new races, we get either a plus two and a plus one or three plus ones. I'm actually gonna go with a plus two and plus one this week because of the way that my stats are gonna work out. Uh, it just ends up being better overall for me. And, and so we're gonna, you'll see what I mean once we get to that. And so speaking of stats, of course, we're using our modified standard array as always. So again, this is not regular standard array. This is not point by, this is not rolled stats. If you're using any of those methods, this will look different than yours and you will just have to adjust accordingly. But with this, we're gonna put our highest stat into our dexterity, our second highest stat into our wisdom, our third highest stat into constitution. And then besides that, it really doesn't matter. It's it's really your personal preference. We don't really need strength. We don't need charisma. We don't need intelligence. We're not doing any kind of crazy multi-classing on this build. Not to say we aren't doing any, but we aren't doing any crazy multi-classing. So we don't need those stats for anything else. I'm gonna put my plus two into my dexterity and my plus one into my wisdom. And of course, we will improve on these stats a little bit later once we get the ability to with ASI levels. Moving on to equipment, I really don't need anything. I, I'm gonna be using my unarmed strikes for pretty much everything, just because our unarmed strikes are tied to our flurry of blows. So I might as well just focus on those. If you wanted to take a quarter staff, you can, and I will provide an alternative that will make the quarter staff, you know, it, even better actually in, in the long run here, if you wanted to do this. Um, we'll, again, we'll talk about it at the end, uh, but th there are alternatives where quarter staff will work just fine with this and um, you can you can totally use that. I'm gonna focus on using my cat's claws and use doing slashing damage as a monk weapon or at least as an unarmed strike. And so we're gonna go with that instead. So let's go ahead and start taking some levels at monk one. Yes, we're starting with monk, which is weird for me, but it's fine. I, I, I'm really not doing a lot of multi-classing on this build. Like I said, we will make it to quivering palm with this. And so for that, I really just wanna get my foundation out of the way and at the very least get extra attack and stunning strike before I think about doing anything else. So at Monk 1 we get Martial Arts, which allows us to use our Dexterity modifier instead of our Strength modifier for our Cat's Claws. So we are dealing slashing damage and we're dealing 1d6 instead of the 1d4. That's a great improvement starting out. And of course this will scale as our Monk die does scale as well, our Martial Arts die. Um, this will go up as well, so eventually it'll be a D8 and then a D10 once we get enough levels under our belts here. We also get Unarmored Defense here, so our uh, AC has improved over what it normally would be. We're not wearing any armor, so it is based on 10 plus Dex plus Wisdom, so it's not too bad, and it will get better, of course, as we go. At Monk 2, we get Key, Unarmored Defense, and Dedicated Weapon. Dedicated weapon, again, is not gonna be used really all that much on this build, but it can be used to great success with others. Key, of course, gives us access to that flurry of blows, which is gonna be so integral to what we're trying to do on this build. And of course, unarmored movement, which is going to improve our move speed over what we can already do as a tabaxi. So for all of those reasons, we're doing pretty good. It, it all kind of works together and makes us just really, really, really fast. At Monk 3, we get our open hand technique as we take our subclass. And so this gives us three options of different types of things that we can subject our enemies to. We can knock them prone, we can push them, or we can prevent reactions. All of these are really good and they don't cost extra key over what we've already spent on our flurry of blows. Again, that's really good design. And we talked about this kind of stuff a little bit when we were talking about the Mercy Monk last week and how, about how good it is to combine these subclass features with the core features. This is just good design. And so you get to keep your key points and just have extra stuff. You can then apply it to more than one creature as long as they're there. For all of those reasons, open hand technique is really, really, really good. Absolutely love that. We also get deflect missiles. Again, like I always say, Never spend key on deflect missiles, throwing it back. It's not worth your key point. Use it on 
your flurry of blows use it on step of the wind patient defense if you need to do things like that that's all i would spend my key on for now we also get key fueled attack which again i don't think is all that necessary right now um we're not going to really focus on it on this build we've focused on it in the past when we did the kensei monk the gunk uh that was used for for great success uh but for this build not so much a monk four we are going to get our first asi or feet and we have an odd number dexterity I want to fix that and we can fix that with not an asi but the slasher feet the slasher feet is of course going to give us some really awesome benefits including a plus one to our dexterity which is fantastic but even more importantly we can reduce enemies movement speed now so here's the thing we can of course hit people with our unarmed strikes and deal damage we can then choose to push them 15 feet away with Slasher, we can then reduce their movement speed by 10 feet. So let's say something has a 30 foot move speed, right? We can push them 15 feet away. They are now down to 20 feet, so they can just barely make it to us. You also could do this when you knock someone prone. And so if you knock them prone, they then have to use half their move speed to stand back up. And then if they had 30 feet of move speed, they only have five feet of move speed left. So for all of those reasons, this is really, really helpful on something like this, which can inflict these types of things. And also they can't take reactions, so you could run away from someone if you have your full move speed. They then do not have their full move speed and therefore have to dash to catch up with you and forego their action. So for all of those reasons, Slasher is super helpful and is very unique to the Tabaxi and really, really helps us out to achieve what it is we're trying to achieve, but trust me, we're gonna make it worse. We then get extra attack at Monk 5, so we can attack twice as our action, and of course twice as our bonus action with Flurry of Blows, so that's four attacks in one turn, which is really strong. We also get Stunning Strike, which I would also very much use. Our key save is not the worst out there. It is a constitution saving throw, which isn't the best thing to target, but it's also, you know, it is what it is. It's a nasty, nasty condition, the stun condition. And so it's worth at least trying, right? It's all good. It's it's at least worth a shot. We also get focused aim. Again, not really worrying about that right now. Uh, again, can't say monk. That, they went great there. Not really worrying about it here. Now that we have extra attack and stunning strike, though, I think now is the time we look elsewhere. And you might be thinking, well, why would you not just go straight to monk 17 and get the open hand thing with quivering palm? Why, why would you not do that? And that is a totally viable strategy. I totally understand that. However, for this build, I'm I'm kind of going for a meme and a gimmick. And so for that, we need a little bit of light multiclassing, very light. So it's not it's not too bad. We're actually going to go with Ranger this week. And I think Ranger actually makes a lot of sense. One, we don't have to worry about anything having to do with our stats. We already were based on dexterity and wisdom, so no problems there. And the, it gives us some pretty interesting features that will actually help us as a monk more so than what you would normally think. So let's jump into that. We, of course, get our favored foe feature, which I'm not a huge fan of. It would be fine if we didn't have to use concentration on it, to be honest, but whatever. Then we also get canny, which is good. We can, of course, take our expertise basically in one stat of our choice. We have proficiency in perception or stealth. I would probably go with one of those. Next at Ranger 2, we of course get a fighting style and we get our spell casting. For our fighting style, unfortunately, the unarmed fighting style is not available for Rangers. And so we can't go ahead and jump ahead to that D8, uh, which kind of sucks. I, I wish we could do that, but it's not there. Instead, I would probably either take blind fighting, which is a little more situational, or Druidic Warrior. Druidic Warrior, of course, gives us access to some Druid cantrips, which can be handy. Of course, if you're using a quarter staff and you wanted to have focused on your wisdom instead of dexterity, you could take Shillelagh here. Um, of course, I'm not focusing on that, so it's not as useful for me. But it's an option, right? But as far as cantrips go, I would probably consider something like Thorn Whip. It's a really fun thing to be able to push them away and then pull them back and push them away and pull them back. Uh, that could be cool. And then, of course, Guidance is never bad. Guidance is a great cantrip for anybody. Uh, giving an extra D4 to the next thing they do is, is always going to be a really, really nice advantage in that situation. For our regular spells, though, of course, Absorb Elements is going to be a main one uh, just to be able to block certain damage. Cure Wounds, Goodberry, most importantly, though, Hunter's Mark. 
Hunter's Mark is of course going to improve our damage over time as we mark our target. And this is much more worth our concentration than a D4 of damage. This is at least a D6. So I would much rather use this than the favored bow feature. It's bad. Moving on to Ranger 3. And this is where we're gonna stop in Ranger. I think we just need the three levels and then we're out. But with this, I want to go with not the Gloom Stalker and not maybe the one that you were thinking, but I'm gonna go with the Swarm Keeper. The Swarm Keeper is a really cool subclass that works really well when you're dealing in really upfront combat, when you're doing melee type combat. And so for this, it works out great, right? We can either deal extra slashing damage, we can push creatures away, we'll come back to that, um, or we can move ourselves away. Now moving ourselves away is probably not gonna be all that necessary. Although again, it's another get out of jail free card. So for all of those reasons, we have a lot of ways to get in and out of, of people's reaches. And so with this, we get another way to push. And again, there is no restriction on the size of the creature that it has to be. Meaning we can move a gargantuan creature barring two saving throws up to 30 feet away from us, which is kind of nuts. We also can, of course, inflict them with the slasher thing and make it to where they can only move 10 feet less than what they normally could. That's also pretty nasty. So for all of these things, we can really limit the movement of our opponents. Now, of course, if you're you know good to go and you don't need to necessarily push them that further amount or you've knocked them prone or whatever, then you can, of course, just deal extra damage with your with your slashing damage. And of course, it's only once per turn, but still it's still nice. And I, so I think Swarm Keeper actually works really, really well here. We also get Swarm Keeper Magic, which gives us Mage Hand and Fairy Fire. Fairy Fire is a fantastic spell, which will really help us to make sure that we are landing our hits so that we can go for those stunning strikes. We can go for those pushes. We can go for those knocking prones, all of that good stuff while dealing some awesome slashing damage in the process using decks because of monk things. It's beautiful. It's just really, really fun overall. But that is where our ranger levels will end because I really think that it's best to just go back to monk and improve our damage dealt overall to get our movement speed increased. We of course get an additional five feet of move speed once we get to monk six. Um, and so for all those reasons, we're gonna head back and we are not gonna look back anywhere else and go for monk the rest of the way. We get wholeness of body here at monk six. And so this is of course a nice little heal, but it only works for us. It does scale really well with our monk levels, um, but ultimately it is quite selfish and so eh, we also get key empowered strikes so we can punch ghosts now, which is great. At monk seven, we get evasion, which is gonna help us tremendously with our dexterity saving throws, which are very common. So that will definitely come up. We of course get stillness of mind as well, which I really don't care about. It's not a good feature. At monk eight, we get another ASI or feet. I would just bump wisdom at this point to an 18. Um, I, I don't see any reason to go anywhere else that improves our key save. It improves our save against our moving people away from us, both from this subclass and from the Ranger subclass. So for all of those reasons, we just want to be improving our wisdom as quickly as we can. At Monk 9, we get our unarmored movement improvement so we can run on uh, vertical surfaces and on liquids. So you can, of course, be dashed now, which is great. Uh, we get Purity of Body at Monk 10, which is fine. Again, I always say this, but this is really only going to come up in a cloud kill for the most part. Um, I haven't seen it come up really much else in any other situation, but cloud kill, you're going you're gonna to be great. At Monk 11, we get Tranquility. So we're under the Sanctuary spell until we break whatever uh, we are using that for. So, of course, you can absorb elements and not break this. You can, of course, do cure wounds and not break this. So there are different ways that you can kind of get around the restrictions of this and, and still maintain your ability to stay safe. So you can kind of tank there and there, there is some tanking potential there. Um, but overall, it's not enough for me to build around it. So unfortunately, it's just it's just not enough to make an entire build around. And then at Monk 12, we're just going to bump Wisdom again just to max that out. Again, if you haven't maxed that out, I would keep going with it. But now I'm at max Dex and max Wisdom, so I get one more ASI, which is good. We then get Tongue of the Sun and Moon at Monk 13. I do not care. Uh, it's a bad feature. Your wizard can do that at level 1. Then at Monk 14, I very much care about Diamond Soul, which is really nice. So that feels really good. We now have proficiency in all saving throws. So I feel really good about that. Timeless Body comes at Monk 
15, which again is just a, a ribbon feature. I don't really care about it. it. It just, it doesn't really add anything meaningful, unfortunately. Among 16, we get one last feat or ASI. I'm probably just gonna take the tough feat here. You could also go with Warcaster if you wanted to have help with maintaining your concentration on your Hunter's Mark. So that's also an, an interesting way to think about this. Um, but overall, I think that's probably better. We already have proficiency in Constitution saving throws from Diamond Soul, so Resilient wouldn't really help us. And so, yeah, that's probably your best option overall. Then we, of course, at level 17 in Monk, level 20 overall, get Quivering Palm. So now we have the suck or save type of thing where we punch somebody and then they just either die or they take a ton of necrotic damage. Either way, we come out ahead. So what do you think of this build? It is very simple, but it's still very effective. And I just think the Swarm Keeper is so fun with the open hand monk. And it could be a really interesting story to tell as to why this very monkey monk is uh, dabbling in dealing with bees or swarms of whatever insect or whatever you're dealing with. I, I think that's a really, really cool thing. For our honorable mentions though, let's go ahead and jump in. One race that would make it make a lot more sense is the Furbolg. The Furbolg is a really interesting race that I have not mentioned at all really since the Cleric days, but this is actually pretty cool because of the invisibility. This gives you a really great get out of jail free card. And of course the disguise self is nice. Being able to change your appearance is also really cool. Um, Furbolgs are just a really awesome race and would work well here. To me, the best overall race option here actually is the Leonin. Because the Leonin also gets the Cat Claws, it will have the improved unarmed strikes based on it being a monk. Now, unfortunately, it will still start at a D4 because the Leonin was not updated, but it will still, of course, gain that D6 once it's of appropriate level. The D8 and the D10, of course, will follow suit as we go. You can still use Dexterity. All of that's fine. The biggest thing, though, here is the bonus action Roar. The fear effect is really, really potent and does not break our Tranquility feature. For all of that, I think if you're wanting to build around Tranquility, I think the Leonin is your way to go. But I think if you're building just basically any other route on this, Tabaxi is probably your best bet. And finally, the Hobgoblin is interesting, the new one. This gives you a bonus action help action, which can be helpful, again, not breaking your tranquility, and just, just some other really useful things that you can do. Um, so there are a lot of really cool ways to kind of get around that restriction. As far as other feats go, you can of course take the Crusher feat if you wanted to just use your regular unarmed strikes or a quarter staff. The quarterstaff, of course, would be preferred as far as dealing more damage. It would work well with the dueling fighting style if we were to take that from the ranger kit. Um, so for all those reasons, that is definitely a way that you can go about this. And I totally, uh, totally understand that. But uh, I, I really like the slasher route for restricting everyone else. But the, the pushing route is definitely just as viable for sure. Of course, I have to mention the mobile feat. But really, the mobile feat isn't all that necessary on this subclass because we have so many ways to get opponents out of our face or at least put them in a situation where it's going to be really difficult for them to connect with us. And so that's going to make it to where mobile is a little bit redundant minus the bonus in speed. So for all that, you know, it's fine. It definitely take it if you want it. But I do think it's a little more redundant on this build than it would be on most others. Finally, other multi-classing options. Number one, if you're wanting to do something with Quivering Palm, the Grave Domain Cleric is your go-to. I would go 17 levels in Monk first, and then I would take two levels in Cleric. At that point, you would of course be able to give the opponent a weakness to that necrotic damage that it takes from your Quivering Palm ability, which is pretty cool, right? Of course, you would have to set this up and it, it would take a while to get going, but it would still be really interesting. So if they save, they take 10 d10 necrotic damage at a weakness or they drop to zero instead either way they're taking a ton of damage and so i think that's really helpful it would of course be better if you had a grave cleric on your team in order to help you with that but if you were trying to be a one person army there that would be an option for you the fighter of course would be great here because it gives you more actions in order to get down all of these things that you want to get down, especially if you dipped cleric or something like that. But again, you're looking at a lot of levels that you would 
uh, have to take here and possibly lose out on Quivering Palm. So unfortunately, I, th I think that Fighter would be uh, too deep of a dip for me to actually need it all that much. You could, of course, go with the you know tried and true Battle Master. You could go with the Rune Knight. All of those things would definitely give you some really helpful options. But overall, I, I think that going Fighter is probably a little bit subpar here. And then finally, the Rogue. The Rogue is always going to be a great option here. It's already dex based. Sneak attack isn't that hard to get. And the Mastermind would actually give us another bonus action way to use the help action. And so that, again, is a great way to get around having to lose your tranquility feature if you don't necessarily want to. So what do we think of this build? Let me know down in the comments below. Next week, we talk about our penultimate monk subclass, the way of shadow monk, and I'm very pumped about that. Until then, stay safe out there, stay healthy. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.